victory address yesterday in Lima, Peru. He spoke to the APEC conference in Lima. Uh, we're going to talk about the economy here with our roundtable. I've got George Will, uh, David Brooks of the New York Times, Robert Kuttner of the American Prospect, also the author of a new book called Obama's Challenge, and Arianna Huffington of the Huffington Post. Welcome to all of you. And let's begin, George, with uh, Tim Geithner, the incoming presumably, uh, Secretary of the Treasury. Boy, the market was impressed by that announcement. The senators seem impressed. Are you? Sure. Uh, he's presided over crises, which is what we're in now. He's presided over a bit of this one, TARP and all that. He presided over Indonesia, Korea, Mexico, all the rest. The problem is the crisis this time is to come up with a stimulus package. The only thing the government can do well and quickly is mail out checks. The trouble is they get to the American households and Americans in their native perversity start doing what they've been told to do for the last 20 years as they start saving them. And that defeats the entire That purpose. is what happened last year. And I want to talk about the stimulus some more, but first let's stick on Geithner. Bob Kuttner, uh, you agree with George? Well, you know, Geithner has admirers that span the spectrum from Barney Frank to, to Pete Peterson, the former uh, Commerce Secretary and uh, budgetary scold. Uh, he's not a Wall Street guy. He's a public servant. He's uh, cool. He's professional. Uh, I think he's done a pretty good job in the crisis. He's also pro-regulation. He's tangled to some extent with Paulson and Bernanke over how much regulation to do going forward. And I think that, I mean, I agree with George that the government has to write some checks, but the government also has to get the banking recapitalization done right, which Paulson did not do. And the government also has to regulate so that they don't get into this cycle of bubble and burst and bail all over again. And, Geithner's pretty good at that. And there have been some suggestions, Ariana, that maybe at least some of his supporters have, have leaked this out in recent days. Well, maybe he was against uh, not bailing out Lehman. After all, he wanted more help from the government. Right, exactly. And, and he's not ideological. And Obama has stressed again and again the importance of this being a fact-based administration where ideology does not rule. And he, in a way, the president-elect, has laid out the blueprint of massive public investment. It's not mailing out checks, as George said. It's very different. It's really rebuilding our infrastructure, rebuilding our schools, doing things that are actually both going to improve the economy in the long term and help get us out of the crisis faster. Geithner and a new New Deal. Uh, maybe. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> uh, you know, I guess the, the one thing I'd say is one of the things they cannot do is go back to the New Deal. One of the things they're talking about is building roads, building bridges. Well, sometimes it takes 80 months to get uh, an infrastructure project actually going. The amount of money spent in the first couple of years in infrastructure, minuscule. So the one thing I'd say to them, think about the new economy. This is a human capital economy. Think about relationships and not roads. And so if I were designing well, employment what does that plans, mean exactly? right, if I were designing employment plans, the things I would think about is do some road building, build some schools, that's fine. But think about national service. Think about how you're going to build relationships. Think about how you're going to build federal money to create communities that actually employ a lot of people in a service sector sort of economy. To me, they're, they're, the way they're talking now, they're doing a lot of reading about Harry Hopkins. Uh, I, would, I would spend a lot more time thinking about how am I going to build relationships using service, building communities. I, I, I really think, respectfully, I, I disagree. It's a kind of a straw man. I mean, I think you have to do all of the above. I think the hit to the economy is so serious. Uh, Contrary to the usual belief, you can get infrastructure programs going pretty quickly, and by giving relief to state and local government, you get help on the way instantaneously. Right now, state and local governments are laying off people. They're deferring projects. They're cutting health and education. If the government cuts a check to state and local governments to the tune of $100, $150 billion, not one of those layoffs have to occur. Freeze up some of their money but, as well. Sure, so it may but, take some time. Let, I, let me just finish. It may take some time to create new jobs but at least we can prevent layoffs from occurring in state and local governments. And you can get infrastructure programs going within six I'm months. I'm not against it. I just say we're, they're talking about, as Chuck Schumer did, five to seven hundred billion dollars. We can agree on state aid. I do agree on that. The things we know work. State aid works. Food stamps works. Extending unemployment, which they've done, that works. That clearly works to stimulate the economy. It's actually very hard to spend seven hundred billion dollars quickly. And what they're, if you've got a Tiddlywinks Hall of Fame, they're going to fund that. They're going to fund they everything. They do that anyway under yeah. earmarks and all the rest. I mean, what you're proposing is reactionary liberalism. That is, whatever exists, double down on it. Before we go into a new New Deal, can we just acknowledge the first New Deal didn't work? That is, the biggest collapse in industrial production in history occurred in 1937, eight years after the stock market collapse of 1929, five years into the New Deal. Well, let me uh, you know, it is really uh, another of the myths that, that conservatives cling to now, that the New Deal 
did not work. And it's really, as, as every sort of myth of conservatism is, has exploded, you know, whether it is, you know, whether it is the fact that the Leave Us Alone coalition, you know, of Grover Norquist, or the um, tax and spend the slogans, those are not being repeated anymore. So now we're going back to the New Deal, or as Senator Shelby said, we're not going to throw money at problems. I mean, I agree with Robert that it's got to be both. It's got to be major infrastructure, public investments, but also the call to service uh, that David talked about has to be central to the Obama administration. He's talked about it a lot in the campaign. It's going to be a big part of the inauguration, I understand. And it's kind of basically a demand to the American people to give of themselves, to help others, and not just to expect government to do everything. Bob, you've got to refute George well, Will. Yeah, I, I wanna, you're saying you want to get in there. <laughs> I, I want to put in a kind word for reactionary liberalism. Um, I mean, there are things like a 21st century electric grid and water and sewer systems that haven't been repaired since the end of the 19th century, and uh, world-class uh, internet uh, uh, access uh, on the infrastructure front. On the human service front, we ought to have universal pre-kindergarten. We ought to have universal child care at professional wages so that jobs that can't be exported pay a living wage. That's services. That's human services. We need to do both things. And the, the, the economy is cratering at such a, a rapid rate that we have to spend serious money. Now, on the question of whether the New Deal worked, Doris Goodwin said to me the other day, don't look at the Roosevelt of 1933. Look at the Roosevelt of 1941, 1942. The New Deal got us halfway out of the Depression. And it was Roosevelt's effort to balance the budget in 1937 that caused the downturn. But in 1941-42, we converted to a wartime footing, and unemployment disappeared. And the deficit went as high as 28 percent of GDP. Now, I'm not saying the deficit has to go that high. But Doris's point was, look at the auto conversion in 1941-1942, where they shut the lines, they retooled, they started making planes and tanks and produced uh, aircraft and, and, and weaponry at a rate that the world had never seen. We could do that with fuel-efficient cars as the price of the well, auto bailout. Really I keep hearing uh, Senator, President-elect Obama talk about green jobs. Yeah, that's my fear, actually. That, that's not a new deal. That's a five-year plan. Uh, if, if we're going to, in, in fixing, say, the auto industry, if we're going to have an auto czar who apparently is smart enough to know how to reorganize these companies, apparently smart enough to know, how, know which green technology, apparently, I guess he's going to be designing carburetors. And that, that is the danger that we somehow start running the economy from Washington, and it's, ex it's Aren't explicit. are we doing that right now? With well, TARP? we're spending out a lot of money in TARP, which doesn't seem to have worked, by the way. But, but uh, fixing the, the finance, or at least shoveling money at the financial sector is one thing. That's a public utility. We've got a to, public utility? Well, well <laughs> I guess I, uh, that's a metaphor. <laughs> well, we've got to stabilize that system. My problem is that I'm for, all for rescuing Detroit if somehow some genius can figure out how to do it. But the problem is getting politics involved. And if we have people, congressmen, a president designing an auto bailout, there's just going to be political uh, fixes which are going to well, screw it all up. The 535 automobile engineers in Capitol Hill have been designing cars for years telling us what fuel they ought to have, what safety standards, how, how you can't, counting against your cafe standards, your fuel economy standards, you can't count the cars you import from your factories in Europe because the United Auto Workers doesn't run those factories in Europe, which may have something to do with why they're producing those cars. What we're doing in the automobile industry is a classic example of this. We're going to take five entities, Chrysler, Ford, General Motors, United Auto Workers, and the federal government, and get them into business competing against America's flourishing automobile industry that employs 113,000 people down south, America.